It's really a pleasure to be here and to speak with all of you um, live and maybe, I don't know, by other methods on the web or... Um, you've heard a little bit about the incidence of breast cancer in young women and um, Dr. Schnabel mentioned that breast cancer is a disease that increases as we get older. But if we look at the statistics from 2011 in the United States, we can see that about 12,000 women under the age of 40 were diagnosed last year with breast cancer. Most of those were invasive breast cancers. And if we look at women under the age of 50, um, it's a much higher number, almost 65,000 women will be diagnosed. So there are um, a lot of young women in this country who will be facing issues related to breast cancer treatment and then survivorship afterwards. And just as we heard that the assessment of risk has to really be individualized, so does the approach to treatment. As Dr. Axelrod alluded, in young women we sometimes see forms of breast cancer that may be more aggressive, but that's not always the case. We know that breast cancer is really more than one disease. There is a broad range of spectrums of different types of breast cancer, and treatment really has to be tailored to not only the specifics of the type of breast cancer, but to everything that's going on in that woman's life. So the goal of cancer treatment is not only to eradicate the cancer itself, but to achieve a, a good balance between good health and a meaningful recovery from cancer treatment. So when I talk to patients about the treatment for breast cancer, we really have to think philosophically about the principles that underlie our decision making. So very often the first step is what I think of as local control, getting the tumor out of that breast and doing what we need to do to make sure that the cancer doesn't come back in the breast. And that often involves starting with surgery. And as you know, there are many different surgical approaches to the primary tumor, um, including mastectomy and breast conserving therapy and evaluation of the lymph nodes. If we do breast conserving therapy, that's usually followed by radiation therapy. And, and sometimes even after mastectomy, we could recommend uh, radiation treatments. The second component of treatment is what I think of as the systemic treatment, which are the treatments that go throughout the body, not just localized to the breast. And those systemic treatments include chemotherapy, hormonal treatments, new targeted biologic therapies, and some of the drugs that we're looking at now um, in clinical trials. So I'm going to address some of these issues one by one. Again, remembering that in each individual case, it is the job of the surgeon and the medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist really working together as a team to come up with a treatment program that is appropriate for that individual. Our goal is, of course, to maximize the efficacy of our treatment, hopefully to minimize the side effects while at the same time we're preventing disease progression. And then, you know, as we're going through treatment and once treatment is finished, to make sure that we're promoting recovery back to as healthy um, a lifestyle as possible. Um, this slide is just, again, a reminder that there are these different subtypes of breast cancer, which we can now um, identify by very sophisticated techniques looking into the molecular characteristics of the tumor cells. And there are also some simple ways that our pathologists can give us a handle on the different types of breast cancer we're dealing with. In a broad brush strokes, we're thinking about cancers that are responsive to the hormones estrogen and progesterone. We call that ER and PR positive cancers. We want to know whether or not this is a breast cancer that is overexpressing a molecule called HER2 nu, which is a growth factor. So when that growth factor receptor is present in a very large amount on the cells, that gives another type of biologic behavior to the cells and may indicate treatments that should be directed at that. And then, as we know, there are some types of breast cancer cells that don't express these particular receptors. Those are the ones that are negative for the estrogen and progesterone receptors in HER2 nu. And we're beginning to really learn more about what pathways might be turned on in those cells that don't express these particular markers. 
So to look at treatment, um, I think that we have to remember for all women, but particularly for young women, as Deborah said, um, the impact of breast cancer is enormous. It is a life-changing event. It impacts our sense of physical integrity and well-being, our psychological well-being. It has an effect on um, not only our own personal emotions, but how we connect with people around us, people we're close to, people in our communities in the workplace, um, and really profound effects on fertility, which Dr. Noyes is going to talk about in greater detail, but also on sexuality and, and intimacy. Surgery, as I mentioned, is often a first step and or may come at another point in the diagnosis. Breast cancer is not a new disease. It's been around forever. And we can read descriptions of breast cancer going back in the even ancient literature. And surgery was, at one time, the only option. Of course, there was no screening. Women presented with large tumors um, in the distant past. So for many, many years, the only option was to do these very radical and very difficult operations. And um, sometimes they were helpful, but of course, it wasn't really the best solution. As our screening has gotten better, as we've been able to find breast cancers that are smaller or that we can render um, smaller if they're large when they start out, we can shrink them down and then look at surgical options. Um, we have many, many more options now. Yes, we still do mastectomies, but we don't do the kind of mastectomies that were done even 20 or 30 or 40, let alone 100 years ago. Um, we do a modification of that operation. There are some instances when women can have the skin or even the nipple areola complex spared at the same time that they're having a mastectomy. Um, so the decision about what kind of surgery to have, again, is a very individual one. It's based on the type of tumor, the location of the tumor, the anatomy of that woman's breast, um, many factors that go into making that decision. If breast conservation is an option, and we're doing what's called a lumpectomy or a ex wide excision, uh, that's often followed by radiation therapy, and we want to evaluate the lymph nodes that drain an invasive breast cancer. Those are usually the lymph nodes under the arm. We call those the axillary nodes. And there are different techniques for evaluating those lymph nodes, whether it's a sentinel node biopsy or a more complete surgical technique where we're looking at a greater number of those lymph nodes. Again, the decisions about this are really um, made on a case-by-case -case basis as each woman is meeting with her surgeon. So. Once the decision about surgery is made, of course, there's an operation. And we know that right after having surgery, um, you know, you don't really always feel so great. There's some discomfort related to the incision. There may be some fluid collecting. There's a risk of infection. There's a risk of bleeding. So there's always that, you know, how do you feel right away after surgery? Um, and then there's how are you going to feel later? I would say that the surgeons, you know, who we work with now are very, very concerned about not just doing an operation that gets the cancer out of the breast, but making sure that there's an acceptable cosmetic result. So if there's a mastectomy, we talk about different types of reconstruction if a woman wants that option. And also paying attention to issues like recovering from surgery. How do we manage that pain? How do we make sure that you're getting your shoulder and your arm and your chest wall mobile and that you're moving and you have a good range of motion and flexibility and doing what we can to prevent swelling of the arm or lymphedema and making sure that the chest wall is um, in good shape. So the surgeons are also paying a lot of attention, not just to doing the operation and getting the cancer out, but making sure that you're healed and intact after the surgery. Radiation therapy, um, I'll only speak about very briefly, is often used, as I mentioned, in breast conserving therapy, but also uh, sometimes after mastectomy. Again, the goal is to get rid of the cancer. Sometimes it's also used to treat lesions that may be painful or prevent complications, particularly if the cancer is more advanced or has spread to other parts of the body. There are some side effects to radiation therapy. Um, the most common ones are the changes in the skin that we see immediately, some redness that usually goes away or some change in the pigmentation. But there are some other issues related to radiation. People can feel very fatigued from the treatment. Um, there can be an increased risk of lymphedema if 
radiation is combined with um, certain types of surgery. And there can be effects on the cosmetic result, especially after reconstruction. So again, our surgeons and plastic surgeons work very closely with the radiation oncologists when we are in a situation where we want to do the best we can to get a good cosmetic result. Radiation therapy rarely, very rarely, can result in second malignancies. Dr. Schnabel told you that in young women who were treated for lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease in the 1960s and 70s, we saw an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, it's a very, very rare, but we do have to let you know that if you've had radiation therapy, there's the possibility of developing a malignancy related to that treatment. Systemic therapy is what I do, along with my colleagues who are also medical oncologists, and these are the treatments that are given as medical treatments that go throughout the body. Again, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, biologic treatments, and so on. Um, so let's talk about hormonal therapy, because I think this is really a big issue, particularly for young women. Hormonal therapy is directed um, against the cancer cells that have receptors for the hormones, either estrogen or progesterone or both. Hormonal therapy may be used even if we're giving chemotherapy uh, or targeted biologic treatments like trastuzumab or HER2-targeted treatment. Hormonal therapy for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is very, very effective. It is known to prolong survival and help to reduce the risk of recurrence, and also is a preventive therapy in terms of preventing cancer in the opposite breast. And Dr. Schnabel told you about the data of tamoxifen in the prevention trials, and we certainly see that also in women who have a history of breast cancer who've been treated with hormonal treatment, that they have a lower risk of getting cancer in the opposite breast if they've taken hormonal therapy. So this slide, it's a little bit cut off at the top, but is a, a schematic to show you where estrogen comes from in our bodies at different points in our life. And if you look on the right hand, uh, I, excuse me, if you look on your left hand side, it says premenopausal. So what's going on here? The brain, that's the hypothalamus, sends a message through a hormone to the pituitary gland that sends another message to the ovary, this is really simplistic, that says to the ovary, okay, make estrogen and progesterone. And then that estrogen and progesterone starts circulating throughout the body and can link up to the cells that have those receptors. And those can be normal breast cells and lots of other normal tissues in the body, or cancer cells that still express those receptors for estrogen and progesterone. So in premenopausal women, most of the estrogen production comes from the ovaries. After natural menopause, the ovaries aren't making so much estrogen anymore, but there still is some estrogen production, and that's coming from other tissues, in particular the adrenal glands and fat tissue. So it's not as if you go into menopause and have zero estrogen. There still is estrogen circulating. So what are the options then if we want to manipulate the way estrogen interacts with that receptor in premenopausal women? We have two approaches. One is to block the ability of the estrogen that's being produced from binding to that receptor. And tamoxifen is the gold standard treatment for that. Tamoxifen is a drug that gets into that estrogen receptor and prevents the circulating estrogen from binding. Another technique that we have is to reduce the amount of estrogen that's being produced. So then there's less estrogen that can get into the receptor, and we can do that by telling the ovary not to produce so much estrogen. Of course, we can surgically remove the ovaries, or we can use medicines that block that signal from the brain going down to the ovary, and those medicines are called Zolodex or Lupron, and we use those to suppress the function of the ovaries. Um, in Europe and other parts of the world, they sometimes give radiation treatment to the ovaries. We don't do that so much in the United States, but um, that could be done also to suppress ovarian function. So coming back to tamoxifen, which is really the main hormonal therapy that we use in young women who have hormone-sensitive breast cancer, again, this is a drug that has been shown over the last 40 years to have an enormous benefit. 
there's a definite improvement in survival in reducing the risk of recurrence, in reducing the risk of cancer in the opposite breast. And then there are a few side benefits. We think that tamoxifen actually helps to maintain bone health because it strengthens the, the bones a little bit and may help to maintain a healthy lipid profile in terms of the cholesterol. But we know that this drug has a lot of side effects. Um, each individual woman will experience this medicine differently. We're all built differently. And you know we can take antibiotics, and one person is allergic, and one person isn't. Um, two women can take tamoxifen, and one feels fine, and the other one has a lot of side effects, and then everything in between. The most common side effects that we see are the menopausal symptoms, even though you're not necessarily in, going into menopause from tamoxifen, but women feel hot flashes. There can be some vaginal discharge. It's usually a clear discharge that's not really very bothersome for most women. There may be changes in the menstrual cycle where there are some irregularities, not right on the button every 28 days, or perhaps changes in the amount of bleeding or the length of the menstrual period. Some women notice that they gain some weight, but not everyone does. There can be a decrease in libido or changes in feelings of sexuality. And then there are the very uh, rare side effects. There's a slightly increased risk of blood clotting. And if you've had a personal history of blood clots or trouble with bleeding or clotting, that's something you should let your doctor know before you go on tamoxifen. And uterine problems can develop in women who take tamoxifen because when tamoxifen binds that estrogen receptor in the uterus, those uterine cells actually feel like they're getting a little bit of extra estrogen, so they are stimulated to proliferate, and that can sometimes cause thickening of the lining of the uterus and lead us to um, do some investigating to make sure things are all right. The actual risk of developing a cancer of the uterus from tamoxifen is very, very, very low, less than a half a percent. And it's much more common in older women, postmenopausal women, than it is in younger women. Many younger women and women under the age of 40 who take tamoxifen or even in their early 40s usually continue to menstruate and are not um, you know, going, into, going into menopause from tamoxifen. Ovarian ablation or ovarian suppression, that turning the ovaries off from producing estrogen, is a little bit controversial. And this is not a standard practice, but it's something that we're interested in. There's some data from European clinical trials suggesting that ovarian suppression may add to the benefit of, of tamoxifen. And this is an unanswered question. Um, there are two ways that, as I mentioned, we can achieve ovarian ablation. One is to remove the ovaries surgically, and we do this particularly in women at high risk for ovarian cancer. The advantage is it works completely. You know, we're not, there are no ovaries there to make estrogen, but of course it's an irreversible thing once we remove the ovaries. Um, so effects on fertility and the abrupt onset of menopause. If we use these other medicines that turn off the signal to the ovary, then, um, of course, we can stop that medicine and potentially reverse the effect of ovarian suppression. And it seems that these medicines are very beneficial in terms of lowering the amount of estrogen that's being produced. Whether or not that will translate into a better outcome, meaning lowering the risk of recurrence or improving survival, is still yet to be seen. And these next three slides are just to show you the schematics of three clinical trials which have recently met accrual and we're waiting for the long-term follow-up. And these are studies that are comparing adding ovarian suppression to tamoxifen or to an aromatase inhibitor like exemestane to see if that's better than tamoxifen alone. Very briefly, the other drugs that we use in hormonal therapy are called the aromatase inhibitors. These are agents that block the production of estrogen um, in that hormone pathway, and they're really used in postmenopausal women or in women who have had their ovaries removed or have their ov ovaries, uh, the function suppressed by one of those drugs. Again, whether or not this is better 
then tamoxifen has not yet been established. We're hoping to see results from some of those clinical trials in the next few years. These drugs also have side effects. Um, hot flashes is uh, certainly present, but with these drugs we see a lot in the way of joint pain, muscle aches and pains, and stiffness. So um, there's always a trade-off. Chemotherapy is used when we're treating cancer cells that seem to be growing rapidly. This is a more common situation in younger women, but certainly there are postmenopausal women who receive chemotherapy also. The decision about whether or not a woman needs chemotherapy, again, depends on the molecular characteristics of that cancer cell. And even if it's an estrogen positive type of breast cancer, sometimes we still feel that the addition of chemotherapy would be helpful. Chemotherapy targets the pathways in the cell that allow those cells to grow quickly. So there are many, many different chemotherapy drugs that have activity in breast cancer. The decision about which drug to use, in what dosage, in which combination, in what schedule is a little bit of alphabet soup, and we're not going to talk about that tonight. It's a complicated set of decisions, and we see research every year that's presented looking at different regimens and trying to perfect the way that we give chemotherapy at the same time as we are working to try and minimize the side effects. So we know that there are benefits in selected individuals who really need this treatment, that it can be very effective, and again, our goal is always to reduce the risk of recurrence and control the spread or progression of disease. Very often, chemotherapy is combined with other modalities. There is certainly a price to pay for chemotherapy. These are tough treatments. We know that there are short-term side effects, that is, what are you feeling when you're going through the treatment, and um, nausea, changes in appetite, changes in the inside of the mouth with respect to taste or sores in the mouth are sometimes uh, still common occurrences, although we are much, much, much better than we were years ago at controlling these side effects. Um, some people have some other GI issues, cramps or loose bowels or diarrhea or constipation. Depends on which drugs um, you're receiving. Fatigue is a very common component of chemotherapy side effects, um, often related to some mild anemia that develops during treatment, but also just the treatment itself causes some fatigue. Hair loss is a major issue, and particularly for young women. I mean, losing your hair is really a big deal. And anyone who says, oh, it's just hair and it grows back, they're not the ones who are going to be losing their hair. It's a big deal. Um, there is some work to try and minimize that, and some people now are looking at the idea of using these cold caps. Um, again, we have a long way to go to minimize hair loss. It's a big problem. There are some other issues that come up with chemotherapy treatment. I don't want to spend too much time on all of those details, and I know that you're going to hear some more about fertility um, later on. But one thing I do want to mention is that for some women, chemotherapy can induce early menopause, and that's something that we need to think about. For the cancers that overexpress her 2 new, it's a very complicated story. This is not just one molecule with one signal. This is a schematic of what the surface of a cell looks like with all these different receptors and pathways and so on. But um, what we're trying to do with our treatment is to target which pathway we think is turned on inside the cell. And if this HER2 pathway is turned on, we use a medicine called trastuzumab or Herceptin, which is very, very effective in targeting that molecule. But there are other drugs that we can use that get inside the cell to target the interior portion of these receptors. And we use these drugs. Ticurb or Lapatinib is one of them. And a number of new agents that are now available to us, pertuzumab on the right hand Right-hand side is a monoclonal antibody which has just been approved, and we're now use, using it in the clinic in treating women with HER2-positive breast cancer. And clinical trials are ongoing in the uh, early-stage breast cancer now with pertuzumab. TDM1 is a new agent that we're, we have seen very promising results from, and we're looking forward to using that um, once it's FDA-approved, hopefully by the end of this year. 
So as you can see, we have this huge array of treatments, surgery, radiation therapy, all of these different systemic treatments with short-term side effects, long-term implications. What happens when you're going through all of this treatment? I mean, you know, it's people sort of get on this train and they have to go. I feel like we're in the boot camp, you know, we're giving you all these orders. You have to have this test and then this thing and this thing and this thing. And months and months go by and everybody troops through what they have to do and then all of a sudden it's kind of like, whoa, what just happened? So the impact of all of this is enormous. Um, psychologically, just getting the diagnosis of cancer, as I said, is absolutely life-changing and it affects every aspect of our lives. Each person who has to confront the diagnosis and the treatment has to confront the whole panoply of emotions that come with that, and that can range from depression to anger to a sense of loss and all of these issues. So it's important that as you're feeling these emotions and processing, that you talk to us about what's going on, because maybe we can help you kind of sort that through, or maybe we can refer you to groups like YSC and other organizations where you can find support, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or through group support. Um, you're not alone going through this. Um, there are so many ways that breast cancer impacts a woman's sense of herself, her self-image physically, but also um, you know, how you see yourself in the world changes. We talked about how this can impact work missing time off from work, missing days off from school, not being around to be there for your family or your loved ones. Um, your sense of creativity and fun kind of can change a little bit. And how do you make plans for the future if there's some uncertainty about, am I going to be healthy and how am I going to feel? These are really big issues and really have to be taken into consideration as we design your treatment plan but also as you're coming out of treatment and coming back into recovery. Um, these are just some points that I think are important as we're talking about these emotional concerns and connections. Ask for help. Let us know how you're feeling. We will always do everything we can to maintain your privacy and a sense of dignity as we are struggling with the impact of this diagnosis and treatment um, and help you to identify appropriate contacts um, to work with. How do you deal with your family? How do you deal with your friends, your community, your fellow colleagues at work? And what does this mean about the most intimate relationships in your life in terms of sexuality? So what happens if you're alone? What if you're already in a relationship? What about the future? We know that there are physical changes. We know there are hormonal changes, um, and it's important that you share with us particularly some of the physical issues because we could probably fix some of those symptoms or uh, concerns if you let us know about it. Also, let us know about what's going on at work, um, and there's a fantastic website I would refer you to, cancerandcareers.org, which has lots of information about how you can accommodate the workplace to what your needs are, and how employers need to be sensitive to what women are going through when they're facing cancer treatment. And then finally, as you're recovering from treatment, you need to take care of yourself, and we need to be paying attention to all aspects of your well-being. So there are many components to that. Um, you heard about the mo modifiable risk factors, and I would emphasize that those are important, not only in terms of reducing risk of developing breast cancer, but in terms of reducing risk of recurrence, so maintaining healthy bones and good cardiovascular health, and doing that through diet and exercise is very important. Obesity is a major problem, and that affects so many aspects of health, so we encourage you to maintain a healthy body weight, to exercise, to drink alcohol in moderation, and then to talk to your physicians about what you need to do to maintain good bone health because many of these treatments can increase the rate of developing osteoporosis. So I'll stop here with um, a beautiful picture from the north of Scotland, um, the sun rising at the dawn, and I think this is just the beginning of us really reaching a new understanding of how to individualize treatments for breast cancer in our age of molecular medicine, and emphasizing that we really work together as a multidisciplinary team. So I'll stop here. <laughs>